Well, my name is Marshall Moore. I'm the VP of Operations and Marketing for Utah Film Studios. And what does that mean? Well, I oversee all the operations here at the studio. Um, and that is everything from marketing to maintenance. I mean, if, if you look at that, uh, it's, a, it's a large building. It's uh, 91,000 square feet, you know, with uh, 39 private offices, three sound stages, a mill shop, multiple bathrooms, heating and air conditioning system. So it has things that are constantly in motion all day long, and those all need to be taken care of. So that's the structural part of the job. And the other part of the job is, is client relations and uh, marketing and public relations and government relations, which all pertains to uh, the different type of operations at the studio. You know, working with our clients, uh, working with city officials, um, and working with our, our legislature on improving conditions for the film industry in the state of Utah. When people hear, oh, there's a Park City Film Studios, you know, or Utah Film Utah, Studios yeah. in Park City. Sure. I wonder if they kind of think it's like Universal Studios, you know, it's some sort of theme park <laughs> attraction. I, I have been asked that before. I've been, you know, say, do you have rides? <laughs> you know, I, I've heard that before. Or, or they expect a tour with a tram. Yeah, we're not there yet, but I wouldn't say in the future that I mean, we won't have rides here, that's for sure. But I won't say it's out of the realm of the possibility to maybe get on a motorized vehicle to drive around what's built out that it might make sense more sense than to walk everywhere but it's not that big you know it's like 30 acres total uh, we have like i said 91,000 square feet that are built now with the parking lot that wraps around it so we can walk everywhere at the moment but yeah i've been i've been approached and, and asked if it's uh, like universal studios but it's probably the closest thing in Utah that we have to uh, a studio like that or a Warner Brothers or a Fox or a Paramount. Why would you want people coming to Park City to know that we have a film studio? Well, it's different. I mean, where else do you find a motion picture production facility, a soundstage in a resort town? You know, it's very rare. Usually you find them in highly populated areas and, you know, Ur more urban areas, industrial areas. You don't really find sound stages in a resort town like Park City. It's not only the tie into a city like Park City that offers high class accommodations and restaurants, but has the Sundance Film Festival. So all that was taken into consideration and where to, to place the studio. And of course, the original owner had the land already and uh, was looking for different things that you could put on the land. Or, and then the, the whole concept of a studio came in, into play when he was, he was approached by um, some different groups of people thinking, oh, this might be a great place to, to put a studio. And of course, uh, I was working at the Film Commission then and, and was not working here and thought, boy, it'd be really nice to have one of those in Salt Lake, you know, closer to the yeah. crew base, Why close Park to the City airport. Yeah. Why Park City? But then on the other hand, I was saying, well, it would be unique. Uh, it would, and, and if you're going to actually do it, then do it. You know what I mean? Then build it and we'll make it work. And so far that's the case. It, it, it got built and it's working. Does the fact that it's in Park City have mm -hmm. its own special attraction? Like do producers go, well, you know, I could go skiing. Right <laughs> the, I, I think the, the most, the, the, the initial reaction is, oh, it's so far. I mean, I think that's just right off the bat. You got to go up to the mountains to get, get to the studio. But when people actually start doing it and overcoming that thought that, oh, it's only 25 to 30 minutes from Salt Lake City, that a lot of times when you're in other cities that are larger, it takes you 25, 30 minutes to go two miles or three miles sometimes, right? So then that thought gets overcome really quickly when you see how easy it is to get here. There's like only one stoplight between the studio and the airport in Salt Lake City. So it's just like freeway driving the entire way. And unless there's a major winter storm or an accident, you can get here uh, quicker than most, most people think. Then it comes down to what's around the studio. So you know you have a facility here, you know you have the offices, but what, where are your film locations? What are you going to when you leave the studio, what is there? There's, of course, there's Heber and Camas and Oakley, which give you that kind of small town uh, vibe. And then you get mountains and meadows and streams and, and uh, fields that uh, allow for that kind of rural uh, feel that you can tie into a place like this versus if your studio's in Salt Lake, you got to drive sometimes an hour to get to those types of locations. So this, the studio puts you in a more uh, convenient place to, to film 
you know, rural areas, areas that are, uh, you know, undeveloped uh, per se. And that's kind of the, the strength of our filming locations here in Utah anyway. But it doesn't work for every single production. I, I'd like to say that it does, but it doesn't make sense sometimes if, if all your locations are rural and in, in the city and in neighborhoods may not necessarily work here. It could, but a show like Yellowstone or one like Blood and Oil where their locations tie in really nicely to where the studio is located, then it works well. The other facilities that are being used uh, mostly around the state, there's a few that are purpose built that are smaller, but they're warehouses, you know, that uh, have been converted for use as uh, for, for film production. How can Park City compete with Atlanta and New Mexico? I mean, what they have sweeping ranches and things like that, mm -hmm. maybe not Atlanta, but. In New Mexico does. Mm -hmm. Where do we sit as far as being competitive for film production? Yeah, that's tough because we it's it's tough to compare to Georgia. So I, I kind of will leave that off the table because they've gone all in on their film industry there, uh, an uncapped film incentive program. They're building an industry uh, there because they want to. It's it's purpose driven there. Mm -hmm. uh, other states like the film incentive program because it brings notoriety to their states, builds up some infrastructure, but nobody's investing as much as Georgia is right now. I guess you could say Louisiana started that trend and really got into it for a while and, and there were some issues with their uh, incentive program, which they've pretty much sorted through. But I think New Mexico is probably the best comparison that you, that you bring up. One, because it's a, a neighboring state and, and two, there's some terrain that is uh, similar. You know, you've got some mountains in uh, New Mexico, you've got some deserts in New Mexico, and of course we have those here too. So we are constantly battling uh, with a state like New Mexico, but where we come up short is, uh, you know, our incentive program doesn't compare right now. Uh, so we're working on that here in Utah to increase ours. Uh, we've seen uh, some growth since it first started in 2004 with a million dollars. We're up to about $9.3 million available for filmmakers between our cash program and our tax credit program. But um, right now, you know, in order to attract more than just one Yellowstone or, or uh, one high school musical or Andy Mack, uh, we'll need to expand that to, to grow the industry even more here and grow the infrastructure. Gotcha. And where do you see that happening or is it happening? Well, I think it's the it's an educational process for for everyone involved that makes the decisions to expand our program, and that's our our governor and our state legislature, and uh, we're actively uh, doing our best to educate them on the benefits of having film here for our rural communities, um, for uh, you know job creation, for tech, for the film schools, all those benefit when there's production actively uh, going on in the state. Speaking for a show like Yellowstone, they've done amazing things in raising all boats around the studio with, um, you know, not only bringing in, uh, you know, students as, and, and transitioning to the set as, as PAs, but also the economic benefits of uh, the small towns that surround here and the, and the hotels and, and the supply companies that supply uh, this show during, during a, a season, which they're spending, you know, $20 uh, million dollars plus uh, each season and I don't know that exact number so that's why I can I can speak for at least 20 because I know that that's uh, kind of what the, what are the, the rebate calls for against um, raising the incentives I mean I, I'm sure there's people that say why we sh we don't need to do that we don't right. need Hollywood types in Utah I think there's a perception one that the money doesn't stay here but it does I think there's a perception that uh, other people from out of state actors, let's say, and producers um, benefit from it personally. That's not the case either. Uh, the incentive is only paid on Utah goods and services and Utah crew and cast. So the rebate only comes when you hire people from the state of Utah. So I think that's one uh, misconception. The other is that uh, somehow uh, the, the, uh, there are some that feel it loses money for the state. How does that work? I don't know, <laughs> but that's that's what I guess. Because they got to spend the money first. Yeah, and then they get some money it's, back. It's but post. They don't get all their money back. Yeah, it's post performance, uh, and uh, you know, 
if you just do the basic math and let's say Yellowstone spent 60 to 80 million dollars in their first three seasons, which is about right, not exact, but in the realm, and we, let's say, paid them 18 million dollars as a rebate, that just do the basic math and you figure, okay, then the, the state is making money. Where it gets a little complicated is when it goes through a, a, a process of, uh, you know, uh, a formula to figure out in a formulaic way how much new state tax revenue is coming uh, through the incentive program and through all these productions that are coming here. I think you'll see a difference with the series that have been here in the last few years. Um, you'll see that, that narrative change a little bit. And that's what has to change is we have to say, this is good for the state. It gives us exposure. I mean, there are movies shot here 80 years ago that are still showcasing Utah. So this is almost like in perpetuity, you get the marketing benefits of a film. And then you have all the tourism benefits that making a movie can bring on some films, not all films, but there are some films where people will come to see film locations. High School Musical being the most recent example of people that will want to see film locations from a particular movie, The Sandlot. There's uh, people who always come to see The Sandlot or all the movies that were shot in Kane County and Moab and mm -hmm. all that. They're still coming there just to see those Powell. film locations where John Wayne, uh, Lake Powell with Planet of the Apes and of course, a lot of other movies, uh, John Carter. Uh, so there, there are those benefits too that need to be calculated in uh, to uh, you know, these formulas that will show that the film industry is very good for the state of Utah, that it creates thousands of jobs every year um, on multiple productions, but we're capped and that's the problem. You can only do so much and then it gets to a certain point and you're like done for the year or you're just doing very small projects after that. So you can only do one Yellowstone and one High School Musical, whereas we could do, if we grew just a little bit, you know, let's say the 9.3 turned to 15 million or 20 million, you could potentially do two to three Yellowstone type shows. And there, therefore, equipment would be used more often and, and expand. The acting base would expand the crew base would expand. And the students that are being educated here in the state of Utah at our film schools would have places to work and stay in Utah. They're not because there's just not enough work. So they go chase wherever the work is, which is, you know, all the incentive states. And there are about 38 or so states that offer competitive incentives and of course other countries like Canada right. and, Serbia. Uh, and, Ser and Serbia, which we definitely lost a show to Serbia recently uh, called the Out Outpost. Uh, out yeah. Where do we, on the scale of all the in states with incentives, where does Utah fall? I would say, I mean, this is just me talking, and, and uh, I would say, like, out of, the, out of the 38 states or so that offer incentives, I would say that we are in the 10, 10 to 15 range of rank. Gotcha. You know, you know, you're going to get the, the states ahead of us, like uh, the obvious ones of Georgia, New Mexico, Louisiana, even California um, has a four hundred million dollar incentive program. California that, does. So yeah, that keeps production from leaving. Uh, yeah, I, I think they increased that too. Didn't yeah, they? well, they did went from one hundred million to four hundred million. Yeah, and I'm not sure what they've done beyond that, but uh, they've done a lot to try to keep production from leaving the state. That's how important it is to them because it's one of their, I think it is their major industry or was. Yeah. So there's that. And then, then there's other states too that are sneaky, sneaky good like Oregon. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll attract a series here and there that they'll beat us out for something or uh, New York and Florida. So, uh, but we're, we're right there, maybe 10. Um, but what, what we offer is a up to 25% post-performance tax credit or cash rebate. Um, the cash is, it has a cap on it too. And the tax credit is only capped annually by the amount, not a project cap. The cash has a project cap. The tax credit is one production could take it all. Do those productions have to be SAG union? Do they have to be? No, but, when, most, but most of them are. There are some smaller, the Community Film Incentive Program, which is great for some of the smaller projects, but most of them maybe go on the micro budget or the low budget um, SAG rates. Because that's what I'm wondering is if, if 
California has an incentive of 400 million and we have an incentive of how many million? Uh, 9.3, let's okay. say, combined. And I thought the main reason that productions wanted to come to Utah was to be able to film non-union. But if they're not mm -hmm. participating in the incentive, what is the Well, you can still film a non-union show and it still be SAG or DGA. Yeah. But 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 it you know, it may not be grip union or electric union or teamster union. So, uh, it is a right to work state. So you can have the guild still participating in a non-union uh, film, but the unions themselves, once they go union, yeah, it's usually all in with uh, grip, electric, uh, transportation, makeup and hair. Uh, so so they're, so they're essentially making the same, same production in California that they would make here uh, contracts-wise. Yeah, if it's a full We're union show. As, not getting as much. Would it be the locations that draws them to Utah at that point? Because we're talking apples to apples. I always thought they wanted to come to U to Utah so they didn't have to worry about union stuff, and that's what the incentive was. More sure, about. and there there was an era where that that was true, um, where there was uh, a lot of non-union work here and mostly non-union work, and that was the draw. But most of those companies um, that were doing that or have done that in the past are all now signatory. Uh, to the union, but there are obviously independent films that still come here that are n not signatory uh, and hire crews independently, and that's still fine. And they can still and that, get part of the incentive. And, uh, absolutely, yes. There's been, and I would bet there's even more in like if you if you took the bulk of all the incentives that have been approved, and it's a couple of hundred through the years. Um, you would find that there are probably more independents than there are union pictures by a landslide. How difficult is it to get approved for an incentive? It's a monthly process. It's an application process that happens every month. And the only difficulty I would say is, one, if there's enough money left to, to approve uh, an incentive for. And I would say that each you know project gets reviewed, um, used to be reviewed by an independent uh, committee uh, once a month. Now it's approved, you know, read and approved by the Utah Film Commission and brought to the Governor's Office of Economic Development Board for final approval of an incentive. So it's not, the process is not difficult. Um, and of course the payments aren't made until the company makes their payments. So the production company has to spend the money first for the state of Utah to be liable to pay anything back. So they, they basically turn in their rebate certificate and say, we spent this much money, a third party auditor comes in, reviews all the receipts to make sure those expenditures were made in the state of Utah, and then the money is paid out. So how we think we lose money on that, I don't know. And that's, we think that's wrong and we, we need to change that narrative. So we're working on that now with the Film Commission, with the Motion Picture Association of Utah, and ourselves here at the studio to change that story because we think the story is not getting told not giving away money. It's accurately. More, you know, you have those businesses, the tech stuff, Silicon yeah. Slips. The, it's not a rebate, right? They offer money up front to companies to come open hmm. up shop, Adobe and that kind of stuff. So there's them to be well, they do approve, um, once again, post-performance incentives. That's the only kind that GoEd does. But there are different types of incentives. They're based on uh, new state tax revenue and only and on uh, job creation uh, to, to qualify for those incentives or business expansion. So it's a, it's a little different structure. Um, but yes, th those are approved in advance in order for them to make that commitment mm -hmm. to the state of Utah. Is there money left now for projects? Because we're not quite at the end of the year. <laughs> well, when because the new cycle starts. Yeah, so How July first. Right it's a good point, and I don't know because I don't I don't work there at the film commission office. I know that when I talk to them, I know that it's a constant struggle for them to uh, talk to clients and say we have enough to do your project. I know that they. Um, they have to turn away projects from time to time, and that's bad for business. They don't like it when I say that. Right. But, but I think people need to know that there's more interest in Utah than we can handle, and they will, these productions will only come if there's a rebate 
involved. Otherwise, they'll go where they other need. places where there are the rebates and, and make it work. I think the set decorator for Yellowstone, she has a great way of describing it. Uh, and I, I, this is not exactly accurate, but she said, basically, if the movie takes place in Alaska and they have better incentives in Florida, they'll shoot it in Florida. Right. Because the incentives are better there, even though it's a story written for Alaska. That's how extreme it can be sometimes, you know. Well, you got the Hallmark movies making <laughs> Christmas movies in the summertime. And yes. And their snow. I exactly right. So you go where the incentives are, and it is a business decision. And that's what everybody has to understand. Amy Redford said, you know, I can't just stay in Utah because I like it. I have to make a financial case for my films, uh, for my film, to, to be able to stay and work somewhere. So it is a business, and, and we have to be able to do a better job of helping to tell the business story of film in Utah. We think it's nice and everything because it's showcasing our landscapes and our beauty, and that's great for tourism, but there's also a hard business case for making movies in Utah that creates jobs and, and lifts the economy in dramatic ways. I mean, if you, if you tell me Yellowstone has, has spent 60 to $80 million dollars over three seasons of 10 episodes a season, and those are, that's five months a season. How good is that for just one production? Yeah. So that's the story that needs to, to be told and everybody needs to understand. And the legislators that vote on these things have to see it as a good thing. There are some that just don't like incentives. Mm -hmm. at all. Just at all. Just think we should be able to stand on our own merits of workforce and, and uh, you know, landscapes. But the truth is, it's all about the, the the money. Now I'm going to ask you this question because I know my actor friends are going to want to have an answer to it. Okay. Is everybody always talks and says, yeah, sure. They go through the motions of trying to cast in Utah mm -hmm. so that they can get the incentive, but then they hire the LA talent. Well, I think you know the answer to that, uh, but I'll tell you what my take on it is. Anybody trying to raise money for a movie knows that you have to have some kind of name value attached. Now, if the name value is in the state of Utah, like if you want to cast Robert Redford and he's in the state of Utah, well, there's a name value right there. Do they go through the motions for the leads? Yeah, I guess sometimes they do. And, and sometimes I've seen where some of the lower budget movies have cast locals in those, you know, number one on the call sheet roles, the stars of the, of the movie. But you're always looking for name recognition or face recognition when you're raising money for a movie or pitching. What percentage that, of the cast needs to come from you, Tiny? Is there no, but it is cast and crew combined. Okay. Uh, I think that number is now 75%. Uh, to qualify for the highest amount, which is 25%, you can still get a base incentive of 20% and not meet that criteria. But and there's you other criteria. Use any anybody from Utah, and you get twenty percent. No, just as long as you make the make the movie yeah. here. But there are other ways to get there too. Like if you make a a uh, educational piece about filming in Utah, behind the scenes look at how great Utah is, and attach that to your DVD or post Thank it on you. your, your your social media. Yeah, I mean uh, there are other ways to to capture that extra five percent um, in terms of promotion. But yeah, it's seventy-five percent cast and crew to get to twenty-five percent. But in terms of w what's actually coming, I don't know. I'm just hoping that uh, you know we keep Yellowstone here and keep them happy, and that they enjoy their experience in Utah. And and that's my primary focus working for the studio is is to to work with uh, the producers of Yellowstone, with Paramount Network, with you know Fire and Ice, the producing company, and and the ones who work here in the building.